Good evening. Uh, Darrell himself wasn't able to be here tonight, um, but I have the privilege of telling his story, his story about Vance Bombardier, Ernest, Lindsay Ernest Barrett. And I look around me uh, uh, um, with my introduction about my 812 medium regiment service and I see quite a few faces uh, that were very influential in my time there. This is a soldier's story and inevitably from this perspective the battlefield is close and smelly and very personal rather than the sweeping view of the general. Lindsay Barrett was a young grazier from the town of Francis in South Australia, which is between Horsham and Bordertown. A bright young lad and a hard worker, he hoped to make a better life for himself and his family. He had a strong ally and mentor in his half-brother and mate, George Hamstone. The pair had plans for land and cattle of their own, and though providing financial support to their family, they saved every spare penny to go towards their future. Indeed, in uniform, he allotted three of his five shillings a day from his pay to George, so as to look after the family, and whatever was left over would go into their kitty. Following his enlistment, in January 1916, Lindsay was allocated to the 13th reinforcements of the 3rd Light Horse Regiment. This unit was mostly horsemen from South Australia and Tasmania, and the regiment was in desperate need of reinforcements following their losses at Gallipoli. Arriving in the staging camps of Egypt, Lindsay found himself in exciting and interesting times. The AIF was growing, and new units were being formed for action on the battlefields of France and Belgium. Lindsay applied for the artillery and was transferred to the artillery on the 15th of May 1916. In late May 1916, Lindsay and, he, Lindsay and his mates broke camp and entrained to the nearby port of Alexandria. There they, they boarded the darkened troop ship Corsican. After cast off, they learnt they were not bound for France. No, they were headed for England, where specialist artillery training awaited. In England, they were introduced to the new 4.5-inch howitzers. Unlike the field guns, the howitzers could fire their projectiles at both high and low angles of elevation, and this enabled a howitzer battery to hit targets which may be sheltering behind the relative safety of hills, villages and other features. As their training progressed, 1916 gave way to 1917, and in March, the best of the gunner trainees were sent to 116th Howitzer Battery, which was preparing to deploy to France. Lindsay was one of those chosen. On arrival at the battlefront, Lindsay was again reposted, this time to 101st Howitzer Battery, which, would be, which was part of the 1st Field Artillery Brigade. This was a veteran brigade having formed and deployed in 1914. They served with distinction at Gallipoli and had given a great account of themselves in France, but enemy action had taken toll on their numbers. By this time, they were in desperate need of rest, refitting, and most of all, reinforcements. However, the rest and refit would have to wait as the infantry were about to make their first assault against the formidable Hindenburg Line. The brigade's 1st, 2nd and 3rd field batteries moved into the line near Vaux-Lagincourt, while the 101st Howitzer battery deployed to the hotbed of the Nuriel Valley. 1st field artillery brigade was in depth. The 2nd field artillery brigade was deployed to their front. The other batteries were scattered on a narrow frontage which saw the guns dangerously forward. The infantry and machine gunners of the 1st Australian Division were busily digging in on the forward lines, but unfortunately they were scattered far too thinly across a 12,000 yard frontage. This 
was to be Lindsay's first exposure to combat. On the 11th of April, the main attack was launched. Fourth Division led the way between the fortified villages of Quant and Bullico. Although they fought valiantly, they were hampered in the assault by the lack of bombs, ammunition and the failure of the supporting tanks to reach the objectives. Inaccurate reports of the situation were reaching the divisional artillery headquarters and the one group commander ordered the guns to suspend firing. With the artillery fire lifting from them, the defending Germans soon took the upper hand. The diggers were forced to withdraw, leaving behind hundreds of dead, wounded and stranded troops who were stuck within the still intact barbed wire. The only fire support came from a 101st howitzer battery when its commander, Major J.C. Selms, went against orders and covered the withdrawal with life-saving fire. With the major Allied assault beaten, the enemy turned its intentions toward the nearby villages around the village of Lallycourt and the Noriel Valley. It was here the German defenders believed they could counter-strike, deliver a savage blow and then roll up the Allied flank. The 1st Division's scattered defence across a broad frontage left severe gaps within the line. Additionally, their positions were under direct observation from the nearby Hindenburg line. On the 15th of April, the enemy launched its counter-attack, catching the infantry unprepared, the enemy was able to breach the forward positions and strike deep into the Australian support lines. The Allied infantry were forced to retire and to reform and prepare for counter-attack. But the guns were now vulnerable and the detachments of 1st and 2nd Field Artillery Brigades were also forced to withdraw, temporarily abandoning the guns. However, this was not before they carried off the breach blocks and the dial sites, thus making them unusable to the enemy. Only 101st Howitzer Battery remained intact and held on to their guns. With the enemy a scant 400 yards to their front, Major Selms was able to secure a half infantry company to provide protection to the battery, thus allowing him to keep firing in order to break up the German attack. So this is the uh, type of gun that was surrendered. Lindsay's battery kept up a steady volume of fire onto the depth positions of the advancing enemy. The Australian infantry quickly reorganised themselves. They advanced with a hasty yet savage counter-attack and were bent on recapturing the guns and driving the enemy back. With tenacity, the diggers started to get the upper hand and pushed forward along the valley floor. The Australian machine gunners were able to seize the high ground and bring their remaining Vickers guns to bear on the retiring enemy forces. The, enemy, the infantry cleared through the gun positions and reclaimed the possession of the guns. The gunners quickly brought them back into action and the, it, their fire added to the torment of the fleeing enemy. However, as they were forced back, the German soldiers realised the threat. They managed to destroy five of the guns before they were driven off. 21 guns were recovered, but five had been destroyed. In mid-July 1917, the 101st Howitzer Battery was re redeployed to Belgium and was engaged in the defence of the strategic town of Ypres. The battery was tactically attached to the 73rd Heavy Artillery Group, who were engaged in deadly counter-battery fire operations. Counter-battery fire is essentially artillery duelling. The purpose of counter-battery fire is to bombard the opposing artillery with the intent of destroying the guns and ammunition and detachments and negating the effectiveness of their shooting. To be on the receiving end of a concentrated artillery barrage by heavy calibre 
uh, guns was devastating and dangerous. Lindsay was manning his gun as he fired in support of the infantry when suddenly they were targeted by counter battery fire. Lindsay was injured when a red hot artillery splinter slammed into his leg. Lindsay's wound was serious enough to warrant hospitalisation and the luxury of a three week break from the carnage of the front line. In October 1917, the battery was in action along the infamous feature dubbed Anzac Ridge. Lindsay was temporarily promoted to bombardier late in the month and took over second in command of number five gun. On the morning of the 26th of October, the battery was firing in support of attacking infantry. The enemy counter battery fire was extremely heavy, but the gunners stuck to their task. Suddenly, an enemy round exploded between numbers five and number six guns of his battery, killing or wounding both of the attachments, except for Lindsay Barrett, who was completely unscathed. Realising the loss of the two guns' firepower would cause a serious gap in the barrage, Lindsay took up to continuing to lay, load and fire his gun single-handedly. For the next 10 to 15 minutes, and under extremely heavy fire from enemy artillery, Lindsay did the work of an entire detachment, but his efforts kept the effects of the rolling barrage generally intact. I suspect the ammunition was already prepared. When the new firing information was relayed to the remaining guns to boost their fire, Lindsay was ordered to tend to his wounded mates. For his actions that day, Lindsay Barrett was recommended for the Victoria Cross. As a recommendation progressed through the chain of command, it was relegated to, or perhaps thought more appropriate to be, the Distinguished Conduct Medal. Lindsay remained with the 101st Howitzer Battery through the winter of 1917-18 and fought through the savage German onslaught of early 1918 following the collapse of Russia and its military implications. He was also on hand when nearly 200 officers, NCOs and men who had enlisted in 1914 were sent back on six months furlough to Australia. By late October 1918, the battery was taken out of the line for a well-earned rest. It had been in almost constant action for the past 15 months, but this break came too late for Lindsay, as during a heavy enemy counter-battery bombardment earlier in the month, he was heavily gassed. He was sufficiently affected to be evacuated. He was invalided to England for specialist treatment to counter the severe effects of the mustard gas and for Lindsay, the war was over. Before Christmas 1918, Lindsay boarded a troop ship bound for home. The authorities felt that the full exposure of another European winter could be dangerous for him, given his condition, and he arrived back in Australia on Valentine's Day. Lindsay's family said that he, like many of his fellow soldiers, did not want the fanfare, the fates, and the political speeches. They simply wanted to get on with their lives and try and put the horrors of war behind them. Lindsay thought perhaps married life would provide him with a purpose and a reason to settle. He married Vera in August 27. One child soon led to two and they ended up with a big family by today's standards. But Lindsay was still not happy and he couldn't settle. He tried a number of jobs, but nothing seemed to satisfy him. He yearned for the rugged bush life, which did not suit the family. With the onset of the Second World War, Lindsay was now 48 years old, and he again offered his services to his country, enlisting in June 1942. He was posted to the 4th Australian Garrison Battalion and detached to the Love Day internment camp. Lindsay was still able to get home on a regular basis with child number 11, a fine young boy 
Darrell Barrett, born in June 1945. Lindsay's Second War Service ended in November 1945, and he again had trouble settling into civilian life. Long periods away, combined with the challenges of providing for such a large family, finally led to the breakdown in the Barrett marriage. He divorced, but later married again, and spent his last years in Murray Bridge. Darrell, the youngest of the Barrett brood, was selected for national serviceman as an infantryman. He served a tour of duty in Vietnam in 66-67 with the 5th Battalion. Returning home, Darrell thought long and hard about reconciliation with his father. He thought perhaps they could connect as one combat veteran to another. But unfortunately, before they could meet, Lindsay passed away on the 18th of September 1967 and today lies at rest in Murray Bridge Cemetery. A mystery that had haunted the Barrett family for over 30 years was the whereabouts of Lindsay's World War I medals, including his coveted DCM. Did he just give them away or did he lose them? Or did he sell them at some stage to support his family? They still don't know. Darrell's wife, Julia, and their daughter were enthralled with researching the family history, but even after 12 painstaking years of research, they still could not uncover the location of the medals. Unfortunately, Darrell Barrett, the Nasho, passed away with the mystery of his father's medals still unresolved. Out of the blue, a British auction house got in contact with the Barretts, indicating that Lindsay's medals and the gold fob given to him by the townsfolk when he enlisted in 1916 were coming up for auction. Would they be interested in bidding for the items? On the day of the auction, Darrell's widow, Julia, their two children and their families primed themselves for bidding, which would be via a phone hookup to England. The outcome was always in doubt. The bidding was spirited, but it ultimately it came down to two bidders and finally the successful bid from the Barretts. Lindsay's medals are now safe and their whereabouts established. Thank you.